Thank you, Keith. It's a great pleasure. Thank you for that fulsome introduction. I really am not the voice of the Today programme. I think my colleague, John Humphreys, would uh, <clears throat> have a thing or two to say about that. Um, it is nice to be here and to be primarily introduced as someone on Radio 4, because I'm afraid wherever I go, uh, I am the bloke of Dragon's Den, um, uh, because Dragon's Den is an entertainment show and has lots and lots of viewers, and entertainment television makes you much more famous than being a presenter on Radio 4. But I know I'm in good company here, uh, and that you are all Radio 4 type people. Um, it's a great honor to be invited to do this talk in the name of uh, Philip Geddes. I should say I actually met him really not very long before he was so tragically killed. He was working at the Express, and he came and met a group of us who were uh, busy on Charwell, active on Charwell, the student newspaper. He came more than once. He was someone we were very impressed with, although I have to admit we were easily impressed with people who had a real job outside and who took the trouble to get to know us. Um, he was encouraging, he was enchanting, and he had a charming way, I should say, of scouting the stories about the rich and famous who populated the university, and still do. Uh, I say I met him, I don't think he would have remembered me. There were a group of us, he spoke to us a few times, um, but we were all very shocked when the news and manner of his death was told to us. Uh, it didn't take long for the then Charwell editor to call me and tell me that he'd been killed in the Harrods bomb, and I just remember it as a very sad and bewildering time in a uh, connecting in a, an awful way, a, a personal acquaintance and a national event. Now, funnily enough, giving this talk in his name has brought back quite a lot of memories to me about my time on Charwell and my time at Oxford. I edited Charwell in 1983. You get eight weeks uh, when you do Charwell. Um, and I look back on it now and I'm shocked, shocked at how much better it is now uh, <laughs> than it was in my day. We really were pretty proud if we managed to get eight pages out. Now it feels like a, uh, a positive uh, encyclopedia of news uh, and stuff. Plus it has a lot more competition than we had in my day. It was just really Charwell. That was more or less it. Um, funnily enough, I remember my Oxford days as one long argument really, one long intellectual tussle, just sitting over a bottle of whiskey or a beer or a glass of wine, arguing with people. Uh, I think it really defined what my university experience was about. Um, and indeed, I think when I think back to Charwell and my time there, I think there was in my head as editor Charwell an argument going on. I felt that what we were about was being feisty and fighting. Um, not particularly good as it is, I, 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 I would say, but I think there was a subliminal premise that it was in our head, which is, and I don't think we were as pompous as the phrase that I'm about to use, but it is the job of the journalist to speak truth to power. Uh, we didn't use the phrase, but uh, it's used quite a lot these days. And in a way, the kind of the argumentative jousty intellectual climate of Oxford and that view of what you're doing at a student newspaper has stayed with me in my journalistic career and I think characterizes a lot of journalism in this country. Deep down, I think journalists think of it as their job to be subversive, to report on the way the colleges are ripping off the students, uh, to report on the way the establishment is ripping off the public. Um, there's an us reasonable people, uh, and then there's them, the authorities, and our job is to, to fight them. And my goal today, in the next uh, 45 minutes or so, is to talk about that view of journalism and the culture that follows from it, the culture of adversarial journalism. I think adversarial culture comes very easily to Anglo-Saxon uh, societies, and I think it comes very easy to Oxford itself. The whole notion of the debate as a form of intellectual discourse is really entrenched here, and very successfully entrenched here, and it did me no harm whatsoever. But I want to assess its role in journalism today. That's what I'm going to do. Now, on that phrase that we do here, the job of journalists is to speak truth to power, uh, I'm not going to spend long on it, but I do want to confess to a degree of scepticism 
about the picture that gives you about what journalists do. The phrase, it is the job of journalists to speak truth to power, contains three premises, all of which I think are arguable. One is that journalists speak truth. One is that power doesn't speak truth. And the third is that journalists don't have power and thus don't themselves need speaking truth to. Um, these are all, I think, worth unpacking. Um, but my own model in my head is a very different picture of our society, which that it's a crisscrossing entanglement of views, hubs of power, different bits of power, and different interests. And in a way, it's not there's this lot and there's this lot, and we have a, a bun fight between them. It's much more that there's a sort of a network uh, of, uh, uh, of competing interests. And successful societies, successful societies need all of these interest groups to hold all of the others to account. It's just more complicated than the binary, the binary view that that phrase, speaking truth to power, has. Anyway, I'm not going to talk more about that phrase. My goal, as I say, is to talk about adversarial journalism. And what I'm going to do uh, is make some initial comments about what it is and what's said about it. And then I'm going to give you some benefits and I'm going to give you some costs of adversarial uh, journalism. It's going to be a cost-benefit analysis, in fact, without any numbers whatsoever. Um, I'm going to be even-handed in assessing the advantages and disadvantages of adversarial journalism. But talking about both sides of the argument carries a risk, because I'm not going to be very adversarial today. I'm going to be positively reasonable. And in some ways, the best way to get across what I mean by adversarial journalism is to pretend for a, a moment what it would be if I made a speech about adversarial journalism in the style of an adversarial journalist. Well, my speech would be powerful because it would start with a point of view. I would take a line for or against it. I would overstate the case I want to make. I would use five arguments in favor of the case I'm making of which two or three were probably fallacious, it wouldn't much matter, and I would mock the opposite point of view without making any effort whatsoever to understand it. It would make for a provocative talk. Uh, it would probably be quite entertaining. And, and this is a huge advantage. The narrative, the talk, the argument flow would be quite linear. Uh, it would move in one direction. That has an advantage that you actually wouldn't have to listen very carefully if I was making it as one-sided as that, because you could zone out for any five or ten minutes and zone back in again with no material loss of content. You would know exactly where you were on this straight-line argument. The other thing about it would be that it would be satisfyingly clear-cut. You would end the talk knowing exactly what I think. I would come across as a decisive kind of chap uh, who's thought about it and knows exactly what he thinks. You might think of me actually as an alpha male uh, as a result of this talk. Um, and people who are unsure of what I was about, of, of the argument I was making, would be made to feel as though they didn't quite understand it or that they were a little bit naive. Some of you would disagree with what I'm saying if I was doing it in the style of an adversarial talk. You would disagree, but even you would be fired up and angry, you would have a reaction. Uh, and so you would leave in a certain way satisfied, even though it was the opposite way to those who agreed with me. Well, annoyingly, uh, as I say, I'm not going to give you a talk on one side or the other of adversarial journalism. I am going to give you a talk covering both sides. As a result, I'm afraid it's not going to be quite as clear cut as you might like. I'm going to probably look a little indecisive and you might even think I'm a, a beta male rather than alpha male by the time we leave. The other bit of bad news is because it's going to have a kind of non-linear direction and will lurch backwards and forwards, you actually have to listen to every word in order to get the point of it. Because if you zone out, you will completely lose, uh, completely lose the thread. Now, as a result of what I've just been saying, you will find that adversarial journalism is actually pervasive in British media. 
and in the best of it. Perhaps the best example of it in our media are the columnists. The columnists who take a line and go for it. They don't try to be open-minded. It isn't a curiosity, an epi a, 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 a write-up of their curiosity. It's a write-up of their view. Simon Jenkins in today's Guardian has a column about a program, a television program I had produced and went out this week. Uh, and Simon Jenkins is, I think, a very good example of an adversarial journalist. Simon Jenkins, in fact, agrees with almost everything I say, said in the TV program, but has made it sound very adversarial by insulting me and calling me egotistical and all these other things and getting one of his points wrong. Uh, and so uh, has made it read adversarial, even though actually he's entirely supportive of the case I made. But I could talk about a million other columnists, Melanie Phillips and Christopher Booker uh, on the right. Polly Toynbee, Owen Jones on the left, Toby Young. These are all people who write and try not to be open-minded and good on them. The Guardian, the Daily Mail are often adversarial in their style. Let's take some recent examples. I think media coverage of the Environment Agency and the cause of flooding in the Somerset levels has been quite adversarial. It's been accusatory. It's been seeking out to expose the Environment Agency and everything it's done wrong. The Daily Mail and the publishing of the uh, whole historic episode of the National Council for Civil Liberties and its toleration of the paedophile information exchange around 1980. Again, it's adversarial in the way it was presented. It was adversarial primarily because it wasn't just an historic write-up about something that was bizarre, weird, fascinating, disgraceful, all these kinds of words may apply, but it was written up as, when are you going to apologize? It was given a prominence. It was written in a, a jacuse kind of style. So adver adversarialism can be an editorial stance. It can be a rule for setting a news agenda, looking for things to uh, expose of other people. It can also be a tone. The BBC is not quite like the newspapers in its adversarial journalism, but it is often adversarial in its interviewing. The US press is much, much less adversarial than the British press. But there's a lot of adversarialism in US media. The shock jocks on radio, Fox television might be put in that same category. And in case it sounds as though all this is a bit old media, uh, Twitter seems to me quite adversarial. Uh, in fact, that might be to dignify what it is. Uh, Guido Fawkes, if any of you read him, is as adversarial as they come. I'd say he's actually a parody of the adversarial style sometimes. And as news becomes, as the fact content of news, as the information content of what has happened becomes cheaper to acquire, basically it becomes very easy to find out what's happened. You don't pick up a newspaper thinking, I wonder what's happened today. You know what's happened today. As news becomes cheaper, as facts have become cheaper, comment is becoming more important in news. And as comment becomes more important, the having of an opinion, holding that view, pushing it, presenting it, mocking the opposition, the adversarial style is very much what uh, I think we see dominating as the tone and style of our media. Now, where does it come from? Well, it goes back a long way, obviously, and we have a very adversarial legal system. We have an adversarial political system in this country. But in many ways, I think adversarial journalism in the modern era dates back to all the president's men, the Watergate scandal, uh, and the whole idea that there are the bastards doing stuff behind the scenes and the journalists find out, uncover it and reveal it. I have an inferiority complex about all the president's men. I'm as far removed uh, from Robert Redford as anybody on the planet. Um, and I, not terribly adversarial in my own personal style. I work on two regular news programs, on news and current affairs programs. One of them is criticized for being too adversarial. And one of them is criticized for not being adversarial enough. And this is why I have this, if you like, rather indecisive ambiguity about adversarial journalism. 
Let me just tell you what is said about uh, two, my two programs. And I have a surprising amount of sympathy with the criticisms that are made of both of them. The Today program, how many of you actually listen to the Today program of a morning? Yeah, OK. Uh, the Today program is often criticized for being too adversarial. Uh, perhaps the most cogent criticism has come surprisingly from a guy called Graham Linehan, who wrote Father Ted, or was one of the writers of the sitcom Father Ted, and came on to the Today program to talk about his new play, his rendition of the old film, The Lady Killers, that had been turned into a play. Um, now, there's some argument with the Today program about whether he was told what he was coming on for, and whether he was treated with the proper honesty of the programme. But when he came on, it turned out it wasn't just Graham Linehan talking about the play, it was Graham Linehan versus somebody else who was going to question whether we should make plays of things that had been successful films. In other words, today had turned it into an argument. Um, and Graham Linehan was deeply upset by this, uh, made that clear on air, um, and then went and wrote about it in The Guardian at great length. And it is really a great piece. You've got to read it. I mean, it is really quite a good... You can just Google Graham Linehan, and it'll be about the fourth thing that comes up is his attack on the Today programme. And I'm going to give you a little bit of it, because it is quite good. The style of debate practised by the Today programme poisons discourse in this country. It's an arena where there are no positions possible except for diametrically opposed ones, where nuance is not permitted, where politicians are forced into defensive positions of utter banality. None of it is any good for the national conversation. Of course, I'm not saying that news interviews can't be adversarial. Sometimes you have to be nasty Columbo or would never get to the truth. But I'm talking about that very specific, very artificial, very today program format of a presenter acting as a referee between two people who've been chosen to represent opposing sides of a manufactured argument. It's a binary view of politics, of life, and as a result, it's a dishonest one. Replace it with anything, anything, because anything would be better. <laughs> Tell us what you really think, Graham. Um, anyway, no, a very cogent attack on the Today programme. And I think some of us can recognise what he means, right? Sometimes you've got a guy talking about a play, you've turned it into an argument, you're not necessarily adding a lot of, of value from it. But the truth is, I work on another programme, The Bottom Line, that gets the opposite criticism. The Bottom Line, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's basically three chief executives sitting around a table, me chairing a discussion, and the idea is to bring, in a relatively soft conversational format, the world, the preoccupations, the thinking of chief executives to a non-business, broad Radio 4 audience. However, for those who feel business has a lot to answer for, uh, it is seen as naive. It's seen as defending entrenched power. Um, and I think there are times when that criticism is justified. It can come across as a bunch of smug, powerful men sitting around a table talking about how good they, can, good they are, can be self-satisfied. The negative correspondence I get about the program uh, is often about salaries and the amount these people are paid and why I don't ask them, call them up on that more. Now, as it happens, I'm going to make a confession here, I actually agree that most of the guests on that program are probably overpaid. <coughs> Actually, I think the presenter is probably overpaid as well, but I, that's, a different, that's a different question. Um, however, I can see the merits of that program, and I don't think it's possible to have one where every week we have a spot where I call up the executives on the salaries they're paid. It wouldn't tell us anything new, and it would have the other disadvantage that we wouldn't actually have any guests on the program if we chose to do it that way. And I think that would be a pity, because there are plenty of times when the programme is actually quite interesting. It's not always, but, but plenty when it is. So in a way, I think when it comes to the bottom line, you have a struggle between those like myself who thought one big part of what you're trying to do is to explain the world as it is, and those, the many listeners who critique it, who think your job is to expose the world as it is, to expose what is wrong with it. And I do have some sympathy with those who think that programme isn't adversarial enough, and that to explain the world is to defend it in some way. 
that if you explain what is going through the minds of those in power, you are to some extent entrenching the vested interests of those in power. But at the same time, I think not to explain the world is to disarm those who want to reach a decision about it. If you want to make up your mind about chief executives, their salaries, are they good? I think you need to listen to them. You need to hear what they're saying. And having them in conversation around a table in a relatively uncritical format is probably going to help you come to a view of some kind. So I see this, if you like, this battle between the adversarial approach and the more gentle non-adversarial approach between the so-called and today. It's, it, it's a bit exaggerated, the adversarial thing on today, but the, the so-called today adversarial approach and the soft bottom line approach, I see that as a dilemma. And that's why I want to go through the advantages and disadvantages of adversarialism in our media. How far and how good and how is it and how proud should we be of, if you like, that campaigning side of the British media? So I'm going to start with the advantages, OK? So we're going to have uh, 10 minutes on the advantages and then 10 minutes on the disadvantages. So advantage number one, adversarialism exposes weakness, and it does it in a very striking and effective way. It does hold people to account. I think it is fair to say people are scared of the Daily Mail. Uh, I know that because I work for the BBC, and I can tell you the BBC is scared of the Daily Mail. And I think that focuses minds on doing things that are not going to get you in the Daily Mail, and that improves your game. And that is a huge advantage to knowing out there the beasts are looking for you to drop that morsel which they can come in that gives them something to eat. Anyone who listened to the interview of John Humphreys with the former Director General of the BBC, George Entwistle, John Humphreys, my colleague, interviewed our own Director General about his performance overseeing the corporation during the Savile scandal and the subsequent uh, Newsnight uh, scandal, other scandal at Newsnight. John Humphreys interviewed him. He interviewed him in what I would have called a mildly adversarial way. It was by no means the most adversarial you'll find John Humphreys. It was a mildly adversarial interview. It didn't try to, it didn't have John Humphreys trying to explain George Entwistle's position for him. John Humphreys was testing George Entwistle's position. It was electrifying listening. It led people to draw conclusions about George Entwistle as Director General, and he was out by the end of the day, by the end of that day, George Entwistle, not John Humphreys. And that is an advantage of adversarial journalism it holds people to account. Number two, it's engaging. And here is where I disagree with Graham Linehan. Although you can criticize the Today program for setting up or concocting a manufactured row, the truth is it works as a way of getting people to listen. Uh, it's funny this, you know, but sometimes we have things where for one reason or another, a producer has screwed up, and two people come on the program and agree with each other. And it's just not quite the same. <laughs> it lacks an edge. And you lose, well, as a presenter, you lose the will to live. But as a, as a, listener, <laughs> as a listener, you lose the thread. You lose the thread. There's something very nice about a binary, simplistic division of the world into this and that. As a listener, you can understand it. And the funny thing is, you're not stupid listeners. You're actually very clever. You know that the world is not all A or not A. It can be a little bit of fuzzy line between. But simplifying things often is reducing them. And reducing them to a binary argument is a damn good way sometimes of making the issue clear and drawing out the points. 
And it gives the, the exchange, the encounter, it gives it a certain meaning. It gives it an entertainment value. It's easier to hang on to. I mean, I often say, because I'm a great admirer of John, and I've, I've, I've become more an admirer since I've been working with him than from before, but there's nothing better than listening to John Humphreys on the case on something where you agree with him. And there's nothing worse than John Humphreys on the case on something when you disagree with him. But either way, you're engaged with John Humphreys, and that is the point, ladies and gentlemen. Reaction in media land is good. And I think an argument is a good way to get you to engage and to get you drawn in and to help you make up your mind. I think it's a good way of doing it. And I think Graham Lenehan, uh, in his devastating critique of today, underestimates massively the value of that. There's nothing to be ashamed of in manufacturing an argument out of two nuanced positions. Nuance is difficult in media. You don't have time for all the nuances. You're trying to get a broad impression, and an argument uh, is a good way of doing that. Right, my third reason for saying that adversarialism is good is that I think it operates as an important safety valve to a frustrated public. I once, in my early days at Today, interviewed Willie Walsh, who was then chief executive of British Airways. He's now chief executive of the, the parent company, but he was chief executive of British Airways. I did, because I came with lots of views about not trying to be adversarial. I came, I gave what I thought was a very civilized interview. I thought I got some interesting lines out of Willie Walsh. I think he said something like, the era of cheap aviation is over, you know, some, what one might think of as a, a good line to get out of a, an airline executive. So I was quite proud of my, uh, my, my interview. And I had a bunch of emails from listeners who didn't agree that my interview had dealt with Willie Walsh as they felt he should be dealt with. Comments like, why didn't you ask him about my lost bag? <laughs> now, there was no way I was going to ask him about a lost bag because it wouldn't be a good use of the time. But I can see how if Willie Walsh has lost your bag, listening to someone have a civilized conversation with him gets on your nerves. And listening to someone or watching, even better, someone throw wet sponges at him or pour a bucket of custard over his head would actually be a more satisfying experience than a civilized conversation about the era of cheap aviation. And I think that is a purpose, one of the purposes of what we do. It is to be seen to be pouring a bucket of custard over powerful people so that people who don't have much power but have lots of daily frustrations in lives, can see that we're on the case, we're out there, that those people do get their minute of humiliation for everything they bestow upon them. The most adversarial interview I have done on the Today programme in my uh, five or six years there was with Francis Maud. It was an interview about public sector pensions it was on the day of a strike, a one-day strike, public servants on strike, over changes to their pensions. And it was really, it was quite an aggressive interview, I think you might say, because I think I was putting to him the idea that the government had rather ex exaggerated the degree to which the cost of public sector pensions was spiralling out of control and was unaffordable. I mean, it involved, the centrepiece of it was a, a slight decline in the, uh, a graph in a Hutton report that showed a slightly declining percentage of national income going into public sector pensions. Now, it actually was an interesting listen. I think it's fair to say Francis Maud, as it regards most listeners, Francis Maud didn't come out of it very well. He didn't appear to be able to explain this graph showing a declining cost, and it just felt as though he probably had exaggerated the cost of public sector pensions. Did that interview change anything? I don't think it did. But I can tell you, the people who were on strike that day, who felt that the case had been misrepresented, really did feel, I think, 
that it was an important moment for them. And I had correspondence from them saying, thank you, you know, for making that point. And it is almost like a victim statement in a court. It is important that people know that views are stated. It's important, even if it doesn't change anything, that there's this, if you like, safety valve in which the anger can be, can be uh, vo voiced and uh, taken into account. And that, I think, is another reason why the adversarial works, why the adversarial interview works, and why columns that vent out a sort of, you know, diatribe, a rant, why these are such a wonderful part of our journalistic culture. I have one last point in defense of adversarial journalism, which is I think adversarialism rings out every last bit of truth on an issue. Adversarialism, in truth, does involve a lot of nonsense. It involves specious arguments and true arguments. And in an adversarial culture, you don't care whether they're specious or, or truthful. All that matters is that they, sort of, they, that they sort of work. And funnily enough, I think you're more likely to get to the truth. You're more likely to get to the truth if every argument, fallacious, unreasonable, reasonable, if there's somebody whose job is just to haul out of the ground every argument that can be found and to mount it against the other side. Look, everybody needs to know what their job is. And it's a sort of psychological truth that you'll do that job better when you're focusing on one thing. You're making one side of the case, you're going to make the other side of the case, we're going to set it up as a battle of egos, and boy, you will really do that job well. You'll hunt out those truths. And politics and law have an adversarial uh, flavour for good, for good cause, for good reason. They get to the truth. Imagine you are innocent of a crime. Would you like there to be, you know, the, the French justice system, for example, it's actually quite adversarial, but it'll often, in some serious criminal cases, it starts with a judge investigating the evidence. And if the judge thinks the evidence is uh, weighty enough, it then goes to trial. It's less adversarial than ours. The judge is an investigating judge. At that point, there isn't a defense and a prosecution. There's one bod whose job it is to work out both sides of the argument. Does that work as well as one side just saying, look, I'm going to manufacture everything for my side and you're going to do the other? I don't think it does. I listen to parliamentary questions, uh, PMQs uh, sometimes. And, you know, I think there's some honesty about that, that bear pit. Um, it's not, let's, it's, it doesn't say let's worry about the truth. It's let's not worry about the truth. Let's try to win. And the funny thing is, that truths, half-truths, untruths, a kind of contest between them probably gets you to more enlightenment than rational people standing up trying to make a balanced assessment of the evidence. Human beings, when they tell you they're trying to be rational and objective, you really want to sort of worry about it because they're probably not rational and objective. Who knows what biases are grabbing them? Well, the great thing about adversarial uh, journalism and adversarial law and adversarial politics is you know exactly where they're coming from and you can benchmark your view against theirs. You don't have to support their view, you just can benchmark your view because you've got a clarity about it. And there's a fundamental asymmetry. I would rather have five arguments out there, two of which were fallacious, than have two arguments, but we're missing a third that was good. And I think adversarial journalism does mean more, more points, more arguments are put on the table. So I think it's a psychological truth that we do better when we are thinking about one side of the argument or the other, and then the rest of us draw our own view, having listened to the fight out there. So overall, I think the discovery of truth is a messy business. And overall, adversarial politics, law, and journalism, and debate often get you to the truth in a good way.
And anyway, journalism, interviews are not just about truth, they're also about engagement and they're about entertainment and adversarialism scores very highly on that. And if you could imagine a non-adversarial game of football uh, where you decide which is the better team by watching them play against each other and they only try to score a goal if they think there's a, an opportunity that the other side has left, only they wouldn't try and do it at the uh, expense of the other side if the other side hadn't made a mistake. It wouldn't have an audience, it wouldn't get to the truth of which was the better team, and it wouldn't play to human nature, be a, a load of old rubbish. Thus rests the case in favour of adversarialism. But let me now turn, I think, if I could, to the argument against it. Firstly, it doesn't suit everybody, and it doesn't suit all personality types. Some characters like the fight, some don't. Some people thrive at Oxford on the intellectual feisty discourse, some don't. It may be even a male-female thing to some degree. I'm a believer in diversity and worry that if we say PMQs and your ability to perform at, par at Prime Minister's questions is a major part of the qualification for being Prime Minister, we might be losing some very good people to that particular job, people who would otherwise be very good at it. It can drive out sensible and rational people. I remember Eddie George, former governor of the Bank of England, being caught out by a journalist. It was at a lunch, it was in 1998, and he was explaining monetary policy and how it works, and a one-size-fits-all policy for a country like Britain or a Eurozone. And a journalist from the Newcastle Echo said, aren't you saying that unemployment in the north of England is a price worth paying to dampen down a boom, an inflationary housing boom in the south of England? And Eddie George, in a rare uh, mistaken piece of honesty, said, yes, in a sense, that is what I'm saying. Now, anyone who thinks about monetary policy knows he was merely stating how monetary policy works. That is what monetary policy is in a single, a, a single currency area. Of course, you wouldn't say, we don't care about the unemployed, or we don't put any fig on their interests. But in a single currency zone, where you're targeting inflation, if there's inflation, then you're trying to dampen down and lower demand in the economy. This was seen as a gap. Did anyone in the press try to defend Eddie George or explain what he might have meant? Or, by the way, he is stating the bleeding obvious. If you understand monetary policy, that is what it is. Did anyone even explain that he didn't use the words unemployment is in the north is a price worth paying? He just answered the question honestly. No, of course not. And people like Eddie George, sensible, dignified, non-partisan public servants find themselves embroiled in a world of adversarial journalism, ensnared, really, uh, in a sub-intelligent way because they're too honest and they're kind of, you can have those people driven out of partaking in public discourse for the reason that it's too risky for them to do so. There's a second problem with adversarial journalism. I think it can be boring and unrevealing. When the MP's expenses scandal broke, which was a very interesting scandal and a very worthwhile one to be exposed, and it was exposed, and it was exposed, and it was exposed, the most interesting thing we had on the Today programme about it was an American behavioural economist, psychologist, behaviour expert, and we asked him what he made of it. And he said, well, you you put your legislators out there, you've given them a test with an expenses system, and you've discovered that your legislators are a reasonable cross-section of human beings. Uh, you've got some very good ones, you've got some very bad ones, and most push the system to some degree, uh, but try and stay within the rules. Now that actually was, I thought, rather revealing and a rather interesting perspective but of course, in an adversarial system where you're trying to catch out the dirty politicians on the make, 
the interesting perspective is sometimes lost because it doesn't accord with the adversarial narrative. And I think sometimes the adversarial narrative can become the predictable one and the interesting or revealing one is lost uh, at the time. So that's my second criticism of adversarialism. The third criticism of it is it does have a tendency, while being engaging and helping you come to a view, it does have a tendency to polarise opinion on issues. And on a lot of issues, I don't know, genetically modified food, for example, uh, often we're going to have to come to some sort of agreement about an issue. And what setting it up in a binary argument way, in which you're either, it's either mad or it's brilliant, but nothing in between. The, 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 the annoying thing about it is, it actually raises the stakes for the two sides and makes it harder to get people to agree. And I think in the US, where you're seeing adversarialism increase in media, and where you're seeing the country become harder and harder to govern, because there is such a disparity of starting points on any discussion of any public policy issue, it gets quite difficult uh, to get people to even sit around a table and bear, share any premises at all in an argument. And I think the adversarial system contributes to that. So those are three arguments against adversarialism. It doesn't suit all types. It can be unrevealing rather than revealing, and it can polarize opinion. But the most significant argument against our adversarial system, and in particular, the, the piece of our adversarial system that sees the job of the journalist as calling out the misdemeanors of an establishment. The most significant criticism is this. We are in a weird place at the moment. There was Richard Nixon, Watergate. In private, he was doing one thing, bad. In public, he was saying other things that were good. We are in a very peculiar place. If you talk to people in positions of responsibility and power in this country today, frequently they are more impressive in private than they are in public. Now that is remarkable that when they go out in public, they manage to put on an act that makes them sound less competent, less likeable, less human than when you actually have a normal conversation in private. In private, you will hear them admit honest mistakes. You'll hear them articulate dilemmas, talk through arguments, explain why their actions are difficult. You also, incidentally, hear them speak English. Then the microphone comes on, and you get a different language, and a language which is altogether, I think, quite a turn-off. It's the kind of thing as you ask them a very obvious question, if you win the next election, will there be a referendum on the EU? And you get an answer that is tortured, contorted, and shoehorns the words cost of living crisis into the first sentence. Now, here's the thing. What should the job of journalists be when you talk to politicians in private and they turn out to be nicer, more competent, and more human than when you present them in public? is our job to say to the audience, by the way, they're really not as bad as they sound on our program. When we have lunch, they're actually quite normal. They speak properly. It's only when, it's for some reason, only when they're here that they sound like this. Is it our job to try and make their case for them? Well, I, I'm uncomfortable with that. But equally, I'm uncomfortable with the fact that we're presenting them perhaps quite as badly as, as, as we are. And I think when you look at your political class, your establishment, the people who it is you're trying to hold to account as journalists under that simple view of our job is to speak truth to them, you have what you might call type one errors and type two errors. A type one error is they're bastards and we let them get away with it, okay? Type one errors are what the Watergate journalists were getting uh, countering. They were making sure that the bad man was exposed. The type two error 
is that we say nasty things or treat as bad someone who is good, who hasn't actually done anything wrong. We're nasty to them when they deserve not to be traduced. Now, the truth is that adversarial journalism puts almost all its weight on avoiding type 1 errors. It is so keen to find the person who is, deserves to be exposed that it will, some of the time, undoubtedly make type 2 errors. It'll call out on people who are actually just trying to do their best. And I think adversarial journalism thinks type 1 errors are the only important ones, and there is no consequence or cost to type 2 errors. I think the value system of adversarial journalism is there is no part, there's no harm in giving a tough time to someone who's doing a good job. Why would that be bad? And I have a slight worry about that. I worry that type 2 errors are actually uh, causing problems. And I'll, I'll give you the two problems that I think they are. One is that if you are too nasty to people who aren't really that bad, instead of getting more exposure to things, throwing a light on things, and opening doors to the mistakes that have been made, which journalism should do, instead of that, you force people to close doors, hide their mistakes, and bury themselves away. And so if you push too hard, you can actually, you can actually cover up things. You can cause cover-ups rather than causing openness. Blaming people for things where they've not really been that unreasonable is not always the best way to get them to analyze their mistakes. I'll give you an example. The Harriet Harman Daily Mail experience over the pedophile information exchange is a very interesting one. You could have imagined treating it much less adversarially, writing about this fantastically odd historic anomaly that a bunch of otherwise sensible people were countenancing a relationship with paedophiles, the National Union of Child Molesters, as, as, as David Aronovich put it, uh, and were, had seriously gone off the rails thinking about liberation and such like. You could think about, you could think about, um, you know, the, 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 you could imagine writing that up and writing it up in a more understanding way that would have drawn Harriet Harman out to talk about how that had, the NCCL had gone off the rails in that particular respect, to talk about the historic experience. But of course, because the male demanded an apology, Harman dug her feet in, absolutely said, I'm not going to apologize. And of course, we never had, I think, as interesting a discussion about uh, the role of the NCCL and paedophile information exchange as we might have had. Let me give you another example where I think excessive blame gets in the way. England football managers, okay? The treatment of England football managers can become paralyzing. It becomes a big part of their job that they simply have to handle the abuse that they get from the newspapers. Okay, it's not as bad as Columbia, but it's not, uh, you know, always very grown up. When we are too nasty to our representatives, we train them to be defensive. We train them to put up barriers rather than open them. And one possibility is that it's the adversarial approach that we've taken that has professionalized their communication function, and that has been of almost universe to, to the universal harm of open and honest communications with the public. It's not working for anyone. I had an encounter with George Osborne after the autumn statement in 2012. The whole big issue had been about whether borrowing was going up or going down. It was going down, he said in his autumn statement, but it was really only going down because of a particular lucky factor, which was the sale of 4G license, the spectrum licenses. I asked him a simple factual question. Would borrowing be going up if it wasn't for the sale of 4G license spectrum? And he wouldn't answer it. And I said, borrowing last year was 121 billion, this year it's 100 and 20 billion, the license is 3 billion, 120 billion plus 3 billion, is that more or less than 121 billion? He wouldn't answer the question. 
George Osborne has a puppy. As it happens, so do I. I've re like him, I've recently got a dog. He will know, and I, will, I know, that when you want that puppy to behave, sometimes wrenching on the lead to pull on the direction you wanted to go on, forcing the puppy in your direction, doesn't work. A little piece of ham, which you hold down there, brilliant, absolutely gets the puppy. Ham is the non-adversarial approach, yanking on the lead is the adversarial approach. Now, you can blame the politicians, right? You can say, well, look, George Osborne should have just answered the question. I know what he would say. He would say, well, if I answered the question honestly, um, it would have just been a news line and Ed Balls would have had victory over me on that day. It would have distracted from everything I'm doing. And I can see his dilemma. And incidentally, I've seen Jeremy Paxman interviewing Alistair Darling on a day when taxes have gone up and asking Alistair Darling, have taxes gone up? And Alistair Darling just waffles around and doesn't, will not admit it, even though it's bleeding obvious uh, from the figures. So the problem is, is that you raise a reaction and I have a horrible feeling that we've kind of arrived at an impasse, or even what econ economists would call an equilibrium, where I think the worst of you, you play it as defensively as you can, your strategy of being defensive is justified by me being aggressive, and, worst of all, my being aggressive is justified by the obfuscation and nonsense of you being defensive. We're now locked into the low road your strategy justifies mine, my strategy justifies yours, and it's very difficult to get out of that equilibrium. It's very difficult to break out of it. It's no good blaming the journalists, as the many politicians do, and it's no good blaming the politicians, as many uh, journalists do. It's obviously one of those situations where you get the politicians you deserve. And my worry is that you end up in a slightly bad place, with less social capital, less trust, less... Uh, with a worse impression of the politicians, perhaps, than you need. Some of you may be aware of a book written in the 1950s called The Moral Basis of a Backward Society. Has anyone heard of that book? I don't know how. It's by a guy called Edward Banfield. He, spent, he was a political writer, scientist. He spent a couple of years in a southern Italian town in the early 1950s. He, he renamed it. He called it Montegrano. It wasn't really called Montegrano. And he writes about the morals, the ethics of that town, and about how terrible that town is. I mean, we're talking 50s, so the kids there would still be alive today. But a lot of them were leaving school at age 12. Um, it was desperately poor. We're talking peasant, peasant Italy, even in the uh, relatively modern age. But he talks about how nothing happens in that town. There's paralysis, there's no, no one organizes a bus service to the other town where there's a good school, a, a secondary school. Nothing happens. And he writes about the political culture. I'll just read you a line. In Montegrano, an official is hardly, hardly elected before the voters turn violently against him. As soon as he gets into office, his supporters say, often with much justice, he becomes arrogant, self-serving and corrupt. At the next election, or sooner if possible, they will see he gets what's coming to him. It's one of those equilibriums in which we assume the worst for someone and they live up to the expectation that you impose on them. He also writes, an office holder will take bribes in Montegrano when he can get away with it. But whether he takes bribes or not, it will be assumed by society that he does. And in this book, which is quite archaic in some respects, the lack of social capital leads to a lack of social progress. No one bothers to do anything uh, because there are never any rewards for doing so. And I worry a little that we have reached that point ourselves with a slightly too strong an adversarial system. The truth about accountability is everybody, journalists, non-journalists, needs to be held to account. But nobody should be held to account to the point at which it becomes paralyzing as to what they're trying to do. So if I had to choose between no adversarialism in journalism or lots, I have to be honest, if it was a binary choice between none and lots, I'm on the side of adversarialism. I would take lots. I would take uh, the Oxford way over another way. But if I didn't have to make it quite as binary, 
I would nudge the, the, adversarial, the adversarial dial down a couple of notches. I think we need to find other ways, as well as adversarialism, to make journalism engaging. I think that's a challenge. It's a challenge for me to be able to do an interview that is engaging and interesting without being aggressive or argumentative. And I think we need, finally, to counter the snobbishness in journalism that says somehow real journalism is journalism that exposes someone's misdeed. That is journalism, absolutely. And it's an important function of journalism. But there are other functions of journalism too. Explaining, enlightening, and discussing, giving space to people to set out views, to think aloud. These are all part purposes of journalism. And we mustn't let that Robert Redford uh, view of what the journalist does as the purveyor of uh, whistleblowers' re revelations about the evil doings of uh, authority. We mustn't let that become the only journalistic show in town. Explaining and exposing are both vital to a flourishing media world. Thank you very much indeed. Thank <laughs> you.